if you have been in a relationship of any sort, if you've been in a relationship over any length of time, you know that at some point in the relationship there comes this deal where you have to have conversations that are hard conversations. Conversations that maybe you feel awkward about or feel like, oh, I don't want to do this, right? But it, it, it generally starts with one person or the other coming and saying, I have something to tell you. I don't know if you've ever heard those words, or I have something I need to tell you about me. Uh, but if you're in a relationship and you hear those words, that's when your heart like drops, right? It's like, oh, uh, what are we about to step into? <laughs> You know, and is this going to be fixable? Is this something that we can work out? You're wondering what's going on, if it was something in their past or if it's something in their present or if there's an addiction or adultery. Or all of those different things start swirling through your mind when you hear those words, you know, I have something to tell you. Um, and sometimes it is. Sometimes it's incredibly serious. Stuff. It's stuff that has to be dealt with right away. It may be a deal breaker for the relationship. Sometimes it's a little bit lighter stuff, but still maybe heavy in your world. Uh, maybe, you know, one person comes to the other and says, I have to tell you something. I'm going to start voting Republican. Or I'm going to start voting Democrat. You know, and it's like, okay, well... I could fix that. You know, I could work on that with him later. I'm just thankful it wasn't adultery or something like that. Um, you know, at, at other times, it, it's the person coming and saying, I, I have to tell you something. I've got, you know, these issues that are going on in my life. And that, that ends up being a big deal. You know, a thing that, that may, may not be as easy to walk past or to, to get over quickly. Um, that's just the way that relationships go. We, we have to have those conversations. If we want to take the next step, if we want to go to where we need to be in the relationship, sometimes we have to have hard, awkward conversations. I remember when Janie and I were, I think we were engaged. We may have still been dating, but we were in, you know, well into dating or either engaged somewhere in there, and we had one of those conversations. Um, I don't remember the exact setting. I think we were sitting down over a meal. But as we're sitting down over a meal, we knew that we were getting serious about this relationship. And so one of us brought up the question about kids. And that's always kind of the you know awkward thing when you're in that point of a relationship. And so I asked J.D., I said, well, what do you think about kids? Do you want to have kids? And she looked at me very confidently and said, I want to have eight kids. And my heart sank in that moment. And I thought, I can't be with this woman, you know? I'm not gonna have eight kids. That's just not gonna work, right? And so I start negotiating with her and telling her, yeah, you know, two, maybe three, <laughs> you know, could we meet in the middle here somewhere? That kind of thing. But if you're a man, you know how this works. You have those conversations, but you really don't have any say in those conversations. She's going to do what she wants to do, right? And so we get married. We got married in January and in March, or excuse me, May. So four months later, she was pregnant. And we were already starting out on this road, you know. And I'm thinking, all right, it's happening quickly. I can't imagine having eight kids here. But it looked like that was the direction we were going. And, and we go through the pregnancy, and it, it was perfectly fine for me. I didn't have a problem with the pregnancy. <laughs> she was sick every day. She literally got sick every day of the pregnancy. Um, it got to the end of that and we had Reagan, our first born child, um, and went through some of the same things that a lot of new parents go through. You know, we went through the things where it's like, why are we having to deal with this? Why can't we sleep like we used to sleep, you know? Or why does this child have to cry to go to sleep? I mean, just go to sleep. You don't have to Cry, you know, don't scream at me if you want food. I'll just get you something and we can be friends, you know, don't scream, right? And we were going through all of that as new parents. Uh, and there was a day where I don't remember what happened, but it was obviously a, a difficult day for JD. And she just came to me at the end of the day and she said, I think I'm good with one. You know, I don't think, I don't think we need more kids at this point. <laughs> And ironically, I became the one saying, well, maybe just one more. Let's just keep that on the table, right? But, but it was one of those things where we had to have the hard conversation. Even though we didn't agree, even though it was a little awkward before we were married, 
we had to have that conversation in order to get to the place where we were supposed to get to in the relationship. That's the way relationships work. Here's the deal. If you are here today and you are a believer, if you're one who says, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ and, and I want to base my life on the things that he has directed me to do, then you have a relationship with God. That may feel weird. That may sound weird. Uh, I mean, the idea of having a relationship with a God that you don't see most of the time, you, you probably had not heard him speak out loud. Uh, but having a relationship with him, that may sound strange, right? But that's what the Bible says we have. And just like our relationships in terms of marriage, uh, sometimes in our relationship with God, we have to have the hard conversation to make sure we're on the same page, to make sure we're hearing him correctly and we're actually getting his input in the things that we are doing. And so this morning, we are going to start that. But, but before we just dive in, going back to that idea that you were in a relationship with God, if you were a believer, Scripture indicates that from beginning to end that it, this is a relationship he is calling us to. It's not just a belief system. It's not just to show up at church and sit in, in the, the pews or the rows. It's a relationship. I mean, from, from the beginning of Scripture, we see that God calls himself our Father. And we are his children. That's a relational thing, right? Uh, there, there are points in Scripture where he makes it evident to us that, that he loves us deeply. Paul talks about the depths of the, and the riches of the love of God for us. And, and then Jesus comes along and he says this. He says, the first command, the most important thing that you need to know is that you need to love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Right. And so, again, it's all this relational language in there. And then. There are points in Scripture, if you've read the book of Ephesians recently, you know this. There are points of Scripture where it talks about our relationship with God almost being like a marriage, a husband and wife kind of deal. Um, and, and so that's part of the reason some theologians, some people who, who think about these kind of things all the time, think that divorce is such a big deal to God. Because if marriage at its best is a picture of our relationship with God, and God is saying, there should never be divorce because I never walk away from you. I never turn my back on you. I never leave you, right? And so uh, all of those things are in Scripture pointing us to the fact that we are in a relationship with God. And, and if that's the case, we have to have these conversations sometimes to talk about the things that are awkward or that are hard or that are difficult. And we're going to start to step into um, a little bit of that today. Here's, here's the good news. If you're not a believer, if you're here and you're saying, hey, somebody drug me here and I you know, am stopped for a little while or I'm just checking things out, I'm starting to, to uh, feel things out in terms of faith. If you're not a believer, actually the things that we're going to talk about today um, don't apply to you. So you actually get to kind of sit back and just relax and laugh at us in the hard conversation that we have to have with God in this moment. But what we're going to start to talk about is we're going to start to talk about the way that our relationship with God is directly impacted by our relationship with money. These are two huge subjects, right? These are two things, uh, spirituality and money, uh, relationship, that, that, those are huge things that we're talking about. And so we're going to bring them together today. Just like if I were to do premarital counseling for you, I would make sure that you, you heard certain things. I would talk to you about communication. I would talk to you about finances because we all know money is one of the biggest things that, that causes arguments in relationships. It's one of the leading things that ends up causing divorce in relationships. You have to have the money Conversation. If you're going to come and spend time doing premarital counseling, I owe it to you to talk to you about money and how that's going to affect the relationship. In the same way today, what we are saying is we owe it to you to tell you the truth about how your stuff affects your relationship with God. So as we jump into this, I want us to start by looking at a story in this is a story that it, it's really fascinating when you just take it and look at it as the story itself, okay? 
this is a story where, honestly, if I would have heard Jesus tell this story in first century Israel, if I was standing around with him and, and listening, I would have thought, I don't know that this guy is right in the head. You know, I would have thought there's something strange about the story. I don't get it, right? So I want to just tell you the story and, and tell it to you in context, and then we'll look at some text after the story. So this is the story that Jesus tells. And as he tells the story, what he's doing is he's opening up the conversation on God and money. He is starting the conversation to say, this impacts the way that you connect to God. So here's the story. It, it, the setting is that Jesus is kind of on a, close to a hillside. There's a lake. Um, and, and there's a huge crowd that's gathered around to hear from him. A lot of these people are just there because they have seen some of the miracles. They're amazed. They want to see more miracles. They want to hear some of the things he has to say. They're not necessarily really going to follow him, but they want to be close to just see. It's entertainment in some ways, right? And so they are standing out there. Jesus gets into a boat and pushes out on the lake a little bit so everybody can see him. And it's kind of like he says, hey, be quiet, be quiet. I need to tell you something really important. And this is the story he tells. He says, there is a farmer who had some seed. Uh, like he had a bucket of seed, and he goes out and he starts scattering this seed. And, and Jesus says, so the seed fell on good soil. And when it fell on good soil, it, it eventually grew and it produced a crop, and it was an amazing crop. And so the seed fell on soil that was not so good, and that seed didn't grow. That's the story. And then he backs up and he says, he who has ears, let him hear. In other words, this is important stuff. You need to know this. Some seed grows, some doesn't. I don't know about you. If I'm there, I'm kind of thinking, I don't get it, Jesus. You know, I think most of us here know that. You know, I think we know that some soil is good, some soil is not so good. I think we know some seed grows. I, I, I don't get it, right? And thankfully, the disciples were kind of on that same plane. They actually come to Jesus and they say, we're hoping there's something deeper here because we don't get the whole, this is really important, some seed grows, some doesn't, right? And, and so Jesus starts to explain the story to them. And just to back up a little bit, when he says, he who has ears, let him hear, what he's really saying there is he's saying, most people won't care to find out the truth about what I'm saying. And so he's really encouraging people, come to me, ask me, let's connect over this. Let's talk about it further. And that's what the disciples do. They come and they say, tell us the deeper meaning because we don't get the reason this is so important. And so what we're going to read is where Jesus just gives them the deeper meaning. He tells them exactly what he meant by this story. It's in Matthew 13, starting in verse 18 is where we're going to be. But remember, like I said a second ago, what he's doing here is he's opening the conversation about God and money. He's initiating this conversation that's a little bit awkward. It's almost like Jesus has come to his disciples and he says, I've got something to tell you. Right? He's saying that to his disciples, and this is the explanation of the story. So let's just read it together. Matthew 13, starting in verse 18, he says this. Listen then to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is the seed that was sown along the path. So and just to hit pause for a second on, on this. What Jesus is about to do is he's about to, to introduce us to four different types of people, okay? And all of these people in some way or another are connecting to God or they're being introduced to God or, or something along those lines. So there is some possibility of relationship that's forming in this story. And the first person that he introduces us to is this person that says it's like this seed that was thrown on the pathway, on, on the concrete almost, um, where it didn't get in the soil, a bird came and snatched it up and took it away. It never grew. It never became anything. This, this person um, that is represented by the seed is the one that I think of who would, if you had a spiritual conversation with them, or if they heard something from the Bible, um, they would look at you and they would probably say, 
do you really believe that? Are you trying to convince me that there is this God out there that I can't see and I can't hear, but he cares about me and he wants to be a part of my life? Are you really going to believe that? <laughs> That's kind of where the first person is. They, they don't get it. The truth comes to them and it's snatched away and taken away immediately. So there's really no connection. There was an opportunity for a relationship. But there was no connection because the person just said, no, I can't, I can't stomach that. I can't believe that that's happened. Jesus goes on and talks about a second type of person represented by a second type of seed. So he says, the one who received the seed that fell on rocky places is the man who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since he has no root, he lasts only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, he quickly falls away. So this is... Second person, another opportunity to connect to God, right? And this person um, is the person that may say, yeah, I believe that there's a God. I mean, you look at the mountains, right? You look at, at the world around us. You look at the, the fact that there's this atmosphere that is perfectly suited for life to be created in this place. You look at the fact that we're the perfect distance from the sun so that we, we're not too hot, we're not too cold. Um, it, it's the perfect place for life. Something had to design this. And, and they would agree with you that something's out there. You know, there, there's a God of some sort. I just don't know what it is. And if you go on to tell them about this man named Jesus who came to earth and he was God who wrapped himself in the flesh of a man. Um, and, and he taught us that if we want to be his disciples, we have to take up our crosses and follow him. We have to suffer with him for the good of the world and for the good of God. They would say, well, yeah, that's, I, I can't go there, right? I believe that there's something, but I, I don't think a God would ask me to suffer with him um, for the good of others. And so they, they fall away at that point. They don't truly connect. The third person, and this is where I want us to hang out for a few minutes this morning, um, because this is, this is the one that's critical to us. This is where Jesus, uh, again, initiates this conversation. But the third person is represented in verse 22. It says this, the one who received the seed that fell among the thorns is the man who hears the word. But the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke it, making it unfruitful. Let that just sink in. Because think about this. This is what's happened. The seed fell on the ground. It put down roots. It started to grow. It, it has life, right? It grows up. But it's choked out by the thorns that are around it so it doesn't ever produce fruit. It doesn't, it doesn't fulfill its purpose. Um, and, and Jesus says that's the third person. Just keep that in the back of your head because we're going to come back to that in one second. The fourth person is represented in verse 23. It says, but the one who received the seed that fell on good soil is the man who hears the word and understands it. He produces a crop yielding 160 or 30 times what is sown. And so this would be the person that you would look at them and say, they are, you know, super Christian, right? They are actually living this out. That they seem to have an incredible relationship with God, and you see the fruit of that in their lives. I would dare say that 90% of the people that come to church in the United States of America are probably number three. We are people that we hear the word of God, we believe it, we start to put down roots, we start to grow, but something happens that starts to choke the spiritual life out of us so that we don't experience what God wants us to experience. We don't see the fruit in our lives that we think we ought to see. And so if you if you think about it in these terms, these may be people that, and, and we each may have said something like this recently, but these may be people that say, you know what, I've been in church for a long time, I've been praying, but for some reason I just don't feel a connection. I feel like, it, you know, the prayer's hit the ceiling and that's like as far as they go. Or these may be people that say, I've, I've been reading my Bible, and as I'm reading my Bible, I see these incredible stories of how God is changing people's worlds. And I just don't see that in my life. I don't know why, but I don't see that happening to me. 
And Jesus identifies one thing in here, in this verse, that he says, this is the reason they are not seeing what they expected to see. This is the reason they're not experiencing God the way they thought they would experience God. Let me just read it to you again. Verse 22 says, the one who receives the seed that fell among the thorns is the man who hears the word. And, and listen, here, here it is. But the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke it, <clears throat> making it unfruitful. I don't know about you, but I read that and I, I think, well, Jesus could have said anything there, right? Anything that, that leads to sin. He could have said that it's because of sexual immorality that these people are unfruitful or are experiencing, you know, some life, but not the fruit that they want. He could have said that it was anger or bitterness. He could have said it was divorce. He could have said it was any number of things, right? But he chose one. And he said, it is because of the deceitfulness of wealth. The cares of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth that this person is not experiencing God the way they should experience God. In other words, if we take it back to our conversation earlier, something has happened so that money has gotten in the way of this relationship. And money is messing up the relationship between this person and God. Something happened that caused it to go wrong. And I think what God is saying to us through this passage is I think he's saying this, if we are not careful, our money can strangle the life out of our relationship with God. If we are not careful, our stuff can choke the life out of our relationship with God. I really believe he's saying, you need to pay attention to this. He's saying, we owe it to you to tell you the truth. Your stuff has a huge impact on the way that you connect to God. We know this is true in our personal lives, right? We know this is true in marriage. I mean, we talked about that a second ago. But just imagine this in, in a marriage situation. Right? Imagine that your spouse comes home or uh, your parent, one of your parents comes home or whatever the case may be. And they say, hey, I realized that we just got paid this month. And I was pretty excited about that. And so she says to him, I, I know this may throw us off a little bit, but I actually spent all of our money um, and I got this incredible new wardrobe. I want you to see everything. I got 10 new pairs of shoes. I got a new necklace. Yeah, I got, I got all of this stuff. And, you know, we may not be able to pay our mortgage this month because I spent all of our money, but I'm going to look so good in this wardrobe, right? Or the husband comes to the wife and says, hey, Honey, I know we just got our paycheck in, and I took the opportunity. I knew you would love this. I took the opportunity to go and take our paycheck and buy a new truck or a new tractor or whatever it is, right? And yeah, it's going gonna, it's gonna to cause some issues. You know, we may not be able to pay our light bill this month, um, but I figured that would be okay because I know you love trucks and tractors just like I love trucks and tractors. And so I went ahead and spent all of our money and we don't have anything left this month. If that happened in your household, I'm guessing somebody would say, this is a problem. This is not good. This is not the way it's supposed to work, right? We need to figure this out because this can't be the direction that we're going. Marriages. But for some reason, we do that exact same thing to God and think that everything is fine. We get in a situation where we go out and we say, I, I needed this and the world has told me I should do this and our family just wanted to eat out 12 times this month and so we did this and God, it's the end of the month and we hadn't even asked you what you wanted to do with the money that you entrusted to us. And, but we, we think you're going to be okay with that because you're nice and you love everybody and it's all good, right? And that's the way that we tend to approach this relationship with God. And Jesus is coming in the story and he's saying, look, 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 look. 
you need to know the way that you handle money directly impacts the way that you relate to the Father. It directly impacts the way that you experience God today in your everyday life. It changes things when you don't consult Him. It's almost like, again, if you imagine the marriage situation, it's almost like you have that money issue and one spouse says to the other, look, I don't want to divorce you. I, I do love you, but I, I've got to figure this out. So I'm just going to separate from you for a little while. You stay here and you do your thing in this house. I'm going to go live somewhere else. We'll just separate for a little while and I'll, you know, I'll do my money thing here. You figure your thing out over there. Um, it, it's almost like we do that with God. We say, you just stay over there. You keep your stuff, you know, and don't don't take my stuff here. Don't get in into my business over here. Everything else, uh, you know, I, I want you to be my God, but we're just going to separate when it comes to this issue. And for whatever reason, we feel like God thinks that's going to be okay. <laughs> what Jesus says is if you're not incredibly careful about the way that you use your stuff, it can actually choke the life out of your relationship with God. That's why Jesus says in another place, he says, you cannot, you cannot be a slave to both God and money. It just doesn't work. You can be a slave to one or the other, but one will always drive the other one. One will always lead the other one. If you're going to be a slave to God, that will dictate the way that you relate to money. If you're going to be a slave to money, the way that you relate to God. That's the only way this works. So, so be very careful about the way that you handle your stuff. Because if you're not, it will choke the life out of your relationship with God. So what do we do about this? How do we take steps forward? I'm not going to give you just a clean answer this morning because we're going to give more and more answers over the next few weeks as we talk about this. But I want to, I want to just have you start asking um, maybe a new question. The way this started to change in my heart, in my mind, um, was when I was in my early 20s, I was pastoring a church in Mississippi, and this was a church that was a very traditional, very formal kind of church. And so when I preached, when I spoke, I had to wear a suit. That's what they expected. That's what the pastors did, was wear suits, right? Some of you in Colorado may have never seen a suit in your life, and I love that. I absolutely love that. I won't explain to you what it is, but it's clothes that cost way too much money um, and are really uncomfortable to wear, right? And so I, uh, I was having to wear those on a regular basis, and I just remember I was reading a little book um, called Rich Christians in the Name of Hunger. Uh, book that's written by a guy named Ron Snyder. If you've never heard of that book, I would I would encourage you to go check it out. It is worth your time. Rich Christians in an Age of Hunger. So I'm reading that book. I'm, I'm preaching a series that's similar to what we're going through now. And as I was doing that, I remember coming home after church one Sunday. And I'm in my suit and I'm worn out. And Janie and I sat down and we're eating lunch together. And I just had one of those aha moments, you know. I, I kind of looked at what I was wearing and I just thought, if God was managing this money, is this what he would spend it on? If God was my financial advisor, is this what he would tell me to spend my money on? Nicer looking clothes or a nicer home or a nicer car or... Is that what he would direct me to do? And I just asked J.D. that. I said, do you think we're using our money the way that God would want us to use our money? And it's been an ongoing conversation since then where God is just molding us and he's shaping us and he's helping us to understand. He entrusts us with so much. And he does it for a purpose. <laughs> If you guys have ever paid attention to statistics, you probably know that just because of the fact that you live in the United States of America, 
you are wealthier than almost everyone who has ever walked the face of the earth. If you have $20 to your name anywhere, in your bank account or anywhere else, you are wealthier than about 80% of the world around you right now. God has entrusted us with so much. And that's why this is such a big deal. I really believe Jesus could have been speaking directly to us in the American culture when he says, if you're not really careful, this will choke the life out of your relationship with the Father. So, so here's what I'm challenging you to do this week. At some point in time, maybe today, maybe at lunch, maybe tomorrow, maybe while you're riding in the car with your family, at some point in time this week, I'm just challenging you to initiate the awkward conversation with your family where you just say to someone that cares about you, to someone that you love, someone that knows a little bit about your life. Am I living in a way that my financial decisions reflect the heart of God? Are the things that we're spending our money on the things that God would want us to spend our money on? That's the challenge. Just start the conversation. And Let's just address the elephant in the room. It may be that some of you are sitting here thinking, okay, he's saying this because he wants us to give more money to the church so that he can have more money. That's where all of this is really going, right? That's what this is all about. If you're in that boat, here's, here's what I would say to you. Um, don't leave Trailhead. Get somewhere else for a while. Get somewhere else to just see if this makes a difference in your relationship with God. And, and walk down that path for a while to see if this changes anything. See if it starts to produce fruitfulness in a way that you haven't seen before. But I owe it to you to tell you the way you handle money matters in your relationship. In the weeks ahead, like I said, we're going to start walking through the, the heart of God in this matter. We've just kind of looked at the problem. We're going to start looking at how God directs us in a lot of circumstances to think about our resources. But this week, you have the conversation. I, I challenge you, have the conversation. Are we using our resources the way that God wants to use them? Let's go to Him and ask Him to help us.